this is Dennis Conley, your Den at the Door, and I'm having the delightful afternoon of being with Mr. Ralph Smith, uh, also known as Smitty, here at the Lily Bay um, uh, Sawmill. And it's quite a historical place. It's quite a beautiful place. It's picturesque. It certainly has plenty of personality. And uh, Ralph, you are the proprietor of this sawmill presently. Uh, how long have you uh, uh, been the proprietor, the owner? Well, I started out here in 79 when I retired. And uh, I learned the business from Ted Wester for the 10 years before that. I helped him saw a lot. And, and some of it bound to rub off on you. So that's um, how I got started in it. I always did like it and worked in the woods and you learn a little over the years. Well, I guess you've had plenty of years, uh, good, healthy, happy years to, to learn your trade. Um, th this particular sawmill, where did the uh, saw apparatus, which we'll be featuring later, where did that originally come from, Ralph? Well, that came, um, Ted bought it as a used mill from Weckler's out by the Y Inn, and it was old then. And it's quite a bit older now. And what is the engine that you use to run it? We use a Minneapolis Moline that was in a landing craft in World War II. <laughs> <laughs> is that diesel or gas? Gas. Gas. Yeah. Does that require much maintenance? Very little. Excellent. And uh, change oil and put gas in it, and that's about all the minimum of care and... Mm -hmm. She's uh, been good to us. And the blade itself, which we'll see later, the blade, is there a story behind it? Those are, uh, we got two of them. One is a 46, and the other one is a 48, I think. There's two blades with insert teeth. They're right behind us here. I'll show them to you. And uh, we uh, replace the teeth in those blades about once a year if you have good luck, <laughs> but if the nails are around, well, then we replace them more often. Uh, too, uh, too, too bad for that when that happens. Not a good, not a good thing. So you produce dimensional lumber here, and you also produce firewood. And I know you have a great market for firewood. Uh, you've supplied a lot of people uh, throughout this area who, because of you, enjoy the the warmth of the fireplace and uh, probably think of you every time they light the fire. Yeah, I had one of them, uh, doctor in town. He says, he says, I'm going to have a lot of time to think about you. He says, he took four load, five loads of wood. Wow. And uh, he used it to primary heat for his house. Oh, wow. That's, that's ambitious. Yeah. So the, the kind of wood that you mill here, what species do you, what do you work with? One, the biggest one is cedar. That's the one we, we have the most call for. And uh, for decks and porches and a uh, lot of uh, outside work then that'll live the it'll exist the longest as far water and, and outside weather cedar will take it yeah. and we do saw some pine too we don't saw as much pine as we used to because there isn't a demand for it that there used to be how about uh, how about the birch or the maple that we find here? Well, the birch, we saw that into um, uh, four by sixes for uh, marine travel lift. Oh, and the pine, the big pine, we saw into ten by twelves, and that goes to marine travel lift for. Uh, blocking in between their steel beams and uh, it clears they have to be dimension why that it would clear the um, uh, boxes and piping that's on this the side of the structural material that uh, they uh, they build the travel lift out of 
Well, this where we're sitting right now, uh, I believe you expressed earlier, we used to be an old Cooper's uh, hut or, or uh, fabrication place for the area for mostly fish and so forth. And this place probably has uh, more personality than any structure I've ever been in. Uh, how much of the personality do you think you've added to it and how much was here when you first came? Well, it was full when I came. So it's, <laughs> it's so you've sort of cleared it out and organized it, Ralph. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, we don't want to do too much. It would lose its personality. <laughs> uh, I see a lot of clever nuances. We see pictures up everywhere with memories from uh, other folks in your family. We see newspaper articles, maps. Uh, this is a, really a treasure trove of the area, and uh, thanks to you. Well, thank you. I, I enjoy it. Yes, it, it's obvious. Now, Lily Bay wasn't always called Lily Bay, was it? What no. was it originally? Um, I think uh, the the book I read. St. Joe's. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, it was named. It was renamed by who and Meshik. why? Um, I can't tell you his first name, but Meshik, uh had a daughter. And her name was Lily, so he renamed the, when the thing was going strong here at, uh, it was Lily Bay. She, he changed it to Lily Bay. Well, here in the southeastern part of Sevastopol is uh, an area that once was a thriving, independent little community. And it was a community because uh, there was a commercial pier, some say 100 feet wide, that extended out into the lake and provided the, uh, the winter port uh, for the town of Sturgeon Bay. That's entirely right. And so how did they transport goods back and forth between Sturgeon Bay from Lily Bay? Well, the summertime it was by wagon, and the wintertime it was by sleigh. And uh, one of the biggest things that they ever accomplished down here off this one dock, it was the closest dock to Sturgeon Bay. And when they brought the steel in for the old railroad bridge, that all came over the dock here and was loaded on wagons and hauled to Sturgeon Bay. Amazing accomplishment. That's right. It's in uh, a minimum of power. Yes, yeah. Horse and ox team. Yeah, that's right. And, and so this would have been, um, and then what caused the diminishing of its importance? Why, why did you think the community, it had like 500 residents, it had right. a sawmill, it had a cooper's house, yeah. it had a, a, a blacksmith, yeah. a little a little hotel. Right. Uh, what, why do you think it diminished in its uh, popularity? Was, uh, when the um, bridge, the railroad come in, when the um, bridge the railroad bridge came in. And then the um, canal was dug. That was the thing that that did it for us. Uh, that uh, when the canal was dug, then uh, the ships didn't have to go around, and they could come into port, and they had protection from the storms. And that was a big item in those days because they had nothing more than sailing schooners. Yep. And so uh, about 1879, that was pretty well completed oh, and underway. Yeah. And, and yes. They, um, they started in um, one of the first biggest industries in town was the canning business in uh, Sturgeon Bay. They were raising, raising peas. And uh, the Reynolds brothers had what used to be the fruit growers, and uh, that was uh, they were hauling uh, the peas in and running them through the viners down there. Interesting. That's very interesting. So, um, so we can we call you Smitty? Is that permissible? Okay, uh, Smitty, you've certainly. Uh, are adding and keeping up the tradition of this beautiful uh, 
old place and the and the and this beautiful warmth and character it has. How would you how would you describe life of that community of 500 back pre 1879? I mean, it would, had to be a cohesive group. They had to work very hard. They were loggers and mostly transporting wood out of here. I'm guessing. Huh? Yeah, that's about it. And uh, the mill was down by the creek, and uh, they had to work together at it. In the winter time, they'd bring their logs in. And there's an area down there that you have to see it to believe it. It's still there, where the banks are. One side there, about I would say a good 20 feet high. There's that much of a cut in that little trickle creek we got right out here. And on the other south side of the creek, there about maybe 16 at the best from water level. And they built a dam there. They didn't have to get any permits those days. Yeah. <laughs> and they built a dam, and um, they raised that water up about eight, ten feet. And they had a place to store their logs in the winter time. They could float them down from further area. Yeah, that, or just bring them in by sleigh and roll them off on the ice. See? Got it. And uh, <clears throat> the banks were high enough that they could just roll them off and they transported themselves down onto the it uh clever engineering uh feet that was that's right huh by hand yes <laughs> so i understand in this area also maybe a little north of here and shivering sands there was another very uh um uh, vibrant character, um, and you. I think you said your father actually knew the man. And can you? Uh, his, there was Wildcat in his name. What? What? What was his name? <laughs> Joe Martin, the Wildcat Joe. They called him, and he uh, he was a Civil War veteran. And when he came back, he had a family, but I never heard why or. But he left the family on the farm, and he moved down there, and he tra trapped wildcats, and uh, and he had a little garden down there, and I don't know if there's any of those, a few apple trees, and he lived out the rest of his life there at Shivering Sands by the creek, and... Uh, I understand he built uh, some little... Uh, little castle-like structure out of out of driftwood and so forth right. and uh, called it uh, the the, the yeah. paradise uh, or the castle romance castle romance that's correct and uh, if, if, is it correct animals lived in the lower level and then he, he invited guests on the upper level that's right <laughs> the ducks were on the lower level <laughs> the chickens were on the second level and uh, he uh, he uh, shared one of those, I don't know which one it was, but with the ducks or the chickens. And then the, the top was for rent out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for anybody who, who liked that, the scent of the combined uh, duck and, and chicken. And so um, he, he was quite a character. Was, it, was there just a path that went up there or no, just there was A little uh, um, trail. It's still there. We call it the Martin Road yet. Huh. And uh, it was, he had a one horse and a two wheel cart. And if he had to go to town, this is his mode of transportation. If he went to town one day, he'd come back the next because you couldn't make the round trip from back there. In uh, in one day and get his business done. Well, maybe also being sort of a hermit in in his life, a little socializing kept him in town overnight. Who knows? Yes, <laughs> Dad told a lot of stories about him, and he uh, he used to he was quite an orator. In election time, only way to get the word out is you had a by voice, and. Uh, He'd be making speeches all over town when he was in there about the election coming and and uh, who was running and why they were running, and uh, he uh, he had a quite a vocabulary 
for uh, all the fellows running for uh, for election. So probably he was more effective in his own way than the multi-million dollar campaigns of today. That's right. That's right. How wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And so back here now in, in your clubhouse, this is this is called the Lily Bay Social, <laughs> Social Center. All right, Social Center. And uh, you meet regularly with your friends uh, once a week or twice a week? No, it's every morning at 10 o'clock. Perfect. And who makes the coffee? <laughs> <laughs> we don't have it. Oh, that's a shame. And uh, so you you come here and you meet every morning and you discuss uh, things that aren't going on today and things that are yeah. going to happen in the future and politics. We always say we settle all the problems of the world. That's good. Too bad you couldn't spread your solution out to the other people so they, they could follow through. Um, do you want to take us around uh, the, the social club and show us a few uh, uh, interesting aspects? Well, And Ralph, we have uh, before us uh, one of the many, many interesting aspects that we see here in the social club. And uh, in the social center, we've got a, a whole array of tools that I'm sure that you use from time to time, and I'm picking up uh, a beautifully balanced little hammer. What is this for? <laughs> well, that's a tin hammer, a tinsmith's hammer. Uh huh. And kind of a lost art today. Yeah, and it was here when I came, and uh, Ted Wester had it before me, and uh, I don't get a lot of use today, but every now and then you're looking for something like that where you can get in and yeah. tap something yeah. that. Uh, you wouldn't do it with a regular hammer. So, uh, Smitty, we've got a picture in front of us of a very old structure, and I believe it's very significant to Lily Bay. Um, can you tell me what that is That's and uh, the, how long it existed? The old boarding house, and uh, or if you wanted to be real good to it and call it a hotel, <laughs> the uh, sailors, when they came in down at the creek, would uh, be glad to get off the boat and out of their hammocks and uh, get uh, in the boarding houses. Even if they had a straw tick, they were happy to um, lay on that. They could at least lay straight instead of in a yeah. cup position. Yeah, in a curled up position. Plus, the you said there was food and they could uh, be warm and uh, out of the rocky big old ship. Sure. Um, and the pier that was here, you say there was like 400 feet long yep. and sometimes 100 feet wide. And they, would they bring the wagons right up on that pier? Oh, yeah. They'd drive the teams right out in the end. And there was a T on the end of the pier. And you, uh, they claim it. You could take a wagon and a team of horses and turn around without backing up. So I had left quite an area there to, in order to turn a team and wagon around that you... Uh, but they... Uh, that pier took a lot of rough days over the years because they didn't have um, any other way to get to Sturgeon Bay. The, uh, the these piers that went up on the lake side, and the, of course Jacksonport had it, yeah. and there was one actually up on Newport as well at one time. Right. They had to be replaced rather somewhat frequently because oh, sure. of the very rough weather and the freeze and so forth. Uh, how long would these piers generally last? <laughs> they, uh, if you got three years out of them, that's about all because the ice. The ice would come sometimes, <coughs> and uh, um, Ed Wester down here had the fish house by the lake. He he knew what kind of ice would cut the piers, uh, cut the, the piling off, uh -huh. and it would be sharp and thin, and then the wind would just work it a little. Yeah. And if uh, he says he'd rather have a strong wind, it wouldn't do as much damage as one of those that cut the piling off. Yeah. So you knew Mr. Wester as well? Yeah. And how long did the, his his fish house last here? 
I would say they used it uh, in the 30s and the 40s. But then after that, it was just a small amount of gillnet fishing. Ah, uh, okay. So, Ralph, here we are uh, near this beautiful wood stove, and it uh, <laughs> looks like uh, an old furnace. Um, That's what it is. Okay. What is the story behind this, Ralph? Well, this was in a apartment house in World War II at, uh, in Sturgeon Bay, and uh, they had... Uh, these apartment houses were just across the road from where the Surgeon Bay School is now. And that's where uh, this uh, came out of one of those apartment buildings. And it's still, yeah. it's a little rough looking, but on the other hand, it's a good heating, heating unit. Well, you and I are a little rough looking, but we still work pretty well. <laughs> Ralph, I saw these other beautiful uh, rectangles, and you have piles of these around. What, what are these for? These are for my crates. Okay. I make uh, half bushel and bushel crates, and they go all over the United States. No kidding. So you make these by hand, basically, a part oh, yeah. machine. And uh, these are the ends of the crates. Yep. And for apples, cherries? No, they, they use them for clothing more than anything else. No kidding. How wonderful. You well, go down and look in um, yes, yes, on yes. deck. Yeah, that's a wonderful place. Well, so, they, they well, use them all the time. And then he's got two other stores, one right. Sister Bay and one Fish Creek. How wonderful. How cool. So, uh, so what got you into this, uh, into this manufacturing of crates? Well, they, in the fall winter, things were, uh, Ted used to make them before I was here and uh, for an order. If you wanted some crates, you'd, Ted would, uh, would build your apple crates for you. But uh, I just made some on speculation one time and they went pretty quick, and right now it uh, there's quite a few of them get out of here every year. I just shipped uh, hmm. fellow was here from Florida hmm. and got some yesterday, and he was going to start a Door County uh, spot in a market down there. No kidding! Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Beautifully done. Uh, we have. A lot of other great things going on here in the uh, in your shed in the social club. We've got <laughs> some dimensional lumber that's uh, drying back here. You've got your wheelbarrow full of fuel to keep warm in here. <laughs> yep, that we can do. Yeah, and uh, when it's very cold, does this turn out enough therms for oh, you yeah. to keep warm in here? Sure. Good. Sure. And you've got some big. Uh, I told you. I, wheel apparatuses. The These saws. Are the blades are. Yep. And I see in these blades, we can look at some other time, but we can clearly see you add these these uh, bits or the, the, where, the blades. Yeah, where the blades go in. And how is that attached in there, Ralph? Just, uh, it's, uh, there's a V yeah. in here. Yeah. And it rides that V and then it bumps up against an end right there. And that seals her up. Huh. And this is the part that comes out and then the, the tooth just lays yeah. on top in the V. And and so they're different metals obviously. Oh yeah. And do you sharpen these or do you buy them? No, uh, uh, we buy them but um, we sharpen them quite a number of times yeah. before we, uh, before they shorten them up. Uh, I can show you over there yeah. on some short ones. So we have some more crates going over here. That's great. <laughs> and you've got some, these are going to be slats for the That's uh, no, Those are uh, boards for the end. And here are some completed uh, pieces. They're like fine pieces of rustic furniture. <laughs> and uh, I see the Lily Bay Box Comp Mill uh, Company uh, in Door County, Wisconsin. And this is uh, what size, Ralph? That's half bushel. Half bushel. Very sturdy, beautiful item. Nicely done. And the wood seems nicely planed down. And this is what size? One, one bushel. One full bushel. And again, very sturdy. 
it has a beautiful finish and yet the rusticness uh, that they use for displaying the clothing um, to help to help show their their fine products and uh, display them to the consumers who are comfortable in knowing they're buying something displayed on a local display rack. Beautifully done. <laughs> so you ship these all over. All over the county, that, they go all over. Isn't that neat? They use them, uh, the Stotzes use them over here in, uh, um, for maple syrup. Oh, really? She's okay. got a, uh, an entrance coming in to her kitchen and she's got her maple syrup there when the folks stop to uh, to get it, you know, well, it's displayed in these boxes and they can, they just tip them up like this and stack one on top of the other. Yeah. And they work like shelving. Yeah, very sturdy. So this gives the local folks another idea if they want to build a nice shelving or stereo component rack or anything yeah. like that. Sure. And we've got saws hanging, we've got pictures hanging, and this is a beautiful um, uh, tree. I would call it a uh, chainsaw tree, and, and we have chainsaws growing out of it. And was that your invention, Ralph? I seen it in an implement shop. There you go. Some years ago. And we had the same problem there. Part of their floor was covered with, with saws. You couldn't walk around, you couldn't get near it. Right. And... Uh, so one wintry day, my oldest boy and I, Dick, I said, let's make one of those things. He, I said, just give us a little more f floor yep. room. Yep, and it's got personality like you <laughs> as well. And it's growing right now, let's see, four saws. And yeah. it's capacity for a couple more. Oh, what, yeah. What is the lily training stick? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> uh -huh. Good friend of mine down the drive here, Gary Steiner. He's got a Labrador, and she's a couple years old, and uh, she uh, she she always has the last word when you when she she wants something. So he made this sta training stick, and he slaps it on his hand, or he reminds us when he lightly hits her or hits the stick that the stick was what. Men business. There you go. <laughs> so do you manufacture those no, too and no, ship no, those around the no, world? No, we don't need those. No, that's great. <laughs> um, you've got a beautiful old bench over here. That probably came with the place. Well, that was another industry that he used to have. Huh. I still use that bench for crates. But the biggest thing uh, Ted did here, he made uh, fish boxes years ago. Okay. That was another yeah. died, by the way, because it's all uh, paper nowadays. Ah. But they, uh, he, uh, he sold um, boxes by the hundreds clean down to two rivers. No kidding. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And the... Uh, so it's mostly all pine. Yeah. yeah. That and popple. Yeah, yeah. Bamagilia. They were a one-way box. Uh, yeah, they yeah. never come back. Yeah, see. yeah. So the sawdust, have we recycled that into anything special? Oh, yeah. what I've got we... guys standing in line for that. And what do they use the sawdust for? For bedding for horses. There you go. That's right. Yeah, that's right. They want the more coarse style, yeah. though, right? Shavings and sawdust, either one. They, yeah. they aren't fussy which one they get, but they want... Uh, it uh, soaks up moisture right. in, in yeah, the soil. Yeah, it keeps and, more sanitary. Yeah. Yeah.
And uh, Smitty, you know, this this corner is just so packed with history that so many of uh, of the residents of the various uh, summer cottages and vacation areas, I'm sure, don't have any idea how significant this is. That's very true. Yeah, it's, and they drive by and they say how quaint and they go on to their house and enjoy the lake. And that's all great. <laughs> but the, the commercial aspect of this particular corner, we were speaking previously about a fishing family called the Westers who were here. And they were very significant in this area. For During what time period would you say? Oh, I don't have it down perfect, but they, um, Grandpa Wester, um, he was um, one of the first fishermen down here in those days, and this goes back a long time, they um, used to uh, go out to their nets and they'd row their boat out there and row it back in after mm -hmm. they lifted the nets. And he had the first motor, a one lung engine, a little gasoline engine with a, with a little line shaft in it to uh, give the boat some speed. And um, that was quite an improvement, not have to row that uh, pond net boat back in and out oh, every amazing. day. Amazing, yeah. So he had a, he he fished and did they do any uh, smoking of the fish here too or well they did a little very little uh -huh. not not too much did he ship his fish out or did he sell it locally they the they come and picked him up by boat uh huh there's a, he they told us me about a boat that used to come across from uh, Michigan and that fellow would come across he had a sailboat and he'd sail across the lake with a load of salt in uh -huh. barrels out of the mines in Michigan. And they use that to salt their fish to keep them till they got them to market. And uh, he'd, um, this fellow, he'd, dry, he'd take orders for salt, barrels of salt. Sure. If it was eight, ten barrels of this place, then go to Jacksonport. If they took 30 barrels, there was more fishermen there. And uh, here there was only the one establishment. And if they went to Baylor's Harbor, a lot of times he'd get rid of the whole load by the time he got, before he got Sister Bay. Yeah. Well, they didn't like to go to Sister Bay either and because because Death Door. Ah, going around. Contend there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But they, uh, they uh, then they turn around, come back down, and pick up the fish. Excellent. So That's they've cool. been salted. The, the barrel's been emptied of the salt. The, the yep. fish was salted down and dried, and they yep. take it off to market. Yeah. Perfect. Now, besides the actual lumbering for dimensional lumber, and I know after the Chicago fire in 1871, this area was just stripped clean because of the great lumber need, there was also a development of tamarack and hemlock, and, and and the hemlock particularly was used for another purpose. They were uh, that was uh, used for when the they tan the buffalo hides in Chicago, and they'd come up here and uh, cut the hemlock and use the small ads and s score it down there as long as they cut the log, leave it lay in the sun. And the sun would shrink the bark on the hemlock so that it would fall right off. Mm. And um, they'd uh, most times they would put it in in um, get it out in two pieces so that it it nested together. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And it would nest together. And uh, Ted told me uh, a couple of times about it when they used to haul it out in the summertime on wagons and then they hauled it to Sturgeon Bay and uh, I don't know what means they used it to get to Chicago at that time if they loaded it in Sturgeon Bay because the bark went to Sturgeon Bay I know that if it was a train if they had a train I don't know yeah but 
They'd ship it down there, and there they'd use it to tan the buffalo hides. So you, it wouldn't be reduced here to the to the tannin syrup, so to speak. They'd they'd bring it to whatever tanning processing plant. Yep. I know Milwaukee had a big one called Vogel at yeah. one time. Same thing, uh, and Chicago had a big processing, um, and so th that that tannin from the from the hemlock basically cured the hides mm -hmm. and stopped it and made it, uh, they'd work it to make it pliable, pliable yeah. and also preserve it. Right. Yeah. But that kind of, they had to really take a lot of uh, trees out to, oh. to fulfill that operation, right? When I was a little shaver, I used to go with my mother. We'd take a wagon in the spring of the year and we'd go over these open sand hills that were back here and we'd pick up the knots from the hemlock mm. and they're hard as stone mm -hmm. and hot when you burn them they're oh, terrifically hot because of the density yep yeah and uh they would uh i know uh if we uh we'd pick up a wagon load of uh we called it summer wood mm -hmm. You, it would, you could light it quick, you had instant heat, then you could let it go out, and it was, uh, you didn't have that terrific heat in the kitchen. You know? uh -huh. And uh, that was before the oil stoves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was another improvement, too. So but they, um, they had um, all kinds of... Uh, possibilities, you know, to use this um, after the lumber die, uh, the, um, you got the bark off of it, then they saw some of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they get two two licks at a, mm -hmm. at a hemlock tree. Two different uh, yeah. needs and crops. Yeah. Well, we're here, uh, we're here going down memory lane and we have some Incredibly great photos of uh, people who have ventured into this uh, beautiful uh, uh, social club and uh, some friends of Ralph's. And he's going to tell us just a bit about each of these uh, memorable pictures. This is uh, Chris Larson and myself. And Chris... Uh, he got slabs from me for years when he was boiling fish at uh, the square rigger. And uh, he used to come down. I saw the slabs up in, in uh, length that uh, they would, uh, they'd they fit under his bucket and uh, for boiling. And he'd come and get it. And year after year, he could just about clean out my uh, uh -huh. slab piles. Yeah. So the cake, what was the event that cake had to do? A birthday? Yeah. Uh-huh. And it had to be mine. In 2003, great picture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here's a great picture of what appears to be part of the operation of the mill. And yeah, here's my oldest boy and myself. Uh, we're sawing. That's a cedar, I can see that. She's got a little tender spot on the butt end here. Uh. And uh, when you uh, bring them up from the time that they could do anything in the mill with you, they know as much about it as I do. Hmm. <laughs> so you, you're the master, and who <laughs> your son helps you, and who yeah. else helps you? And uh, I've got um, uh, one... The boys down on the shore here is retired from uh, um, Johnson Wax. He helps me quite a bit. He's uh, retired at 55. I think he had 30 years in. Wow. Um, Dave Barnes. That's, that's And uh, I've had uh, quite a few the boys helping me, different fellows. And uh, they keep dropping off. It kind of scares you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ralph, this is a beautiful picture from 1997, and it shows you with 
a number of friends. Was that a particular <laughs> event? I see all the antlers hanging above in the rafters. That was a, um, one of my first birthdays we had down here, and uh, there was uh, quite a few people at the birthday party, and uh, you couldn't get them all in the house. Hmm. You had to use the outside in order to, to entertain them. <laughs> well, when you have that many friends, that's going to be an overflow of your warmth. <laughs> Ralph, this is a beautiful shot of you working at the mill itself, and... Uh, you're concentrating on something there. Uh, I think your fingers are getting a little too close to the blade, though. <laughs> well, that uh, he is in too bad a shape up here yet. <laughs> but um, he had a nice cedar log there that we're working on. You usually make on that side log that size. You usually get a bunch of two by eights out of it, and they're always in demand. Yeah, yeah. Do you mill the sides down on the, on it as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Here's a, here's a beautiful shot of some harvesting activity. Uh, are those your grandkids? Those are the grandkids up above. And my oldest boy and myself on one side, and Bill Wonky on the other side. And we were hauling it out in the spring. They had been snowed in. That's You can see the lo snow sticking to the logs and... We were cutting um, pine up there for, uh, that would be for Tim's house, I think, my youngest boy. We were cutting, milled, and um, all the lumber for the boys in Mary's house, too. Wow. And... Uh, it uh, helped the kids out a little bit yeah. getting started. How, how long after you cut and mill a log, say it's pine, do you need to have it... Uh, a, a year. A year before it should be used. Yeah. Yeah. And and that way it won't change dimensionally too That's much. That's right. Huh? Neat, neat pictures. Um, well, I have, to, I have to tell you, this is one of the most enjoyable afternoons that I've spent in a long time. <laughs> well, thank uh, you. You are truly, you know, uh, in places like Japan and uh, in Ireland, as a matter of fact, they have people who are considered living treasures of their culture. And they look up to them and they give them special honors. Uh, I don't know what special honors could be available for you, but you are truly a living treasure of this whole area of Sevastopol, Lily, Lily Bay, um, and people driving by should, uh, should reflect on the quality of life that you live in, and the good attitude you have and the fun you have in being productive here with the sawmill. Well, it's something that you enjoy it, and you've got Good friends that help you, you can't ask for more. That's right. That's right. Thank you.